Okay, so I'm going to admit. Okay. Give, I'll be back in two seconds. Okay. Hello, hello. Let's wait for a couple more minutes. Okay. So it's a pleasure to welcome you to this talk, Rethinking Identity, Memory and the Notion of Belonging. The second of our talks accompanying the exhibition, Paula Rego and her contemporaries. Uh, last week's session uh, was fantastic. We were joined by the lovely Anna Palma, who told us about her work and the importance of her grandmother in getting her into nature and consequently into art. She had a fascinating conversation with Mara and Nina Perlman. This week, we will be hearing from our other selected artists, Cliff Andrade, as well from Mara uh, and Katrin Zanz. I'll say just a few quick words about each of them and then leave the floor to them, obviously. So Mara Alves is the curator of Paulo Rego and her contemporaries. She's a contemporary art curator from Lisbon, currently studying an MA in art history at the University of London. Her platform, Portugal, aims to promote Portuguese culture internationally, and she has curated an array of art projects in London, including for Caspia Contemporary Gallery, the Dragon Gallery, Start Art Fair, and at the Contemporary Gallery, gallery sorry where she uh, she was the chief curator for three years uh, cliff andrade is one of the two artists selected in our open call uh, i congr congratulate you again cliff and thank you uh, he studied at glasgow school of art before completing his masters at the royal college of art he's a winner of the jill todd photo award and a finalist up for the Association of Photographers Award and the Aesthetica Art Prize. Uh, and he, his work has been uh, exhibited all around the UK. He works with a range of media and his art draws from his own experience. And he's particularly interested in the idea of home and its importance to our sense of personal identity. And finally, Catherine Zanz, uh, trained as a cultural scientist and curator, and has over 15 years of experience uh, working in the arts. She holds a master's degree in cultural studies, Spanish and contemporary history from the Unbot Universitat zu Berlin. Uh, I'm not sure if I said this correctly, uh, and a diploma in curating from Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, before becoming the head of cultural programs at the Goethe Institute, she works on international documentary films. Her studies, research, and work have seen her life all around the world. She's uh, also one of the presidents of Unique London, uh, Unique is the network of the EU National Cultural Institutes in London, bringing unique European arts and culture to the UK. So uh, thank you all. And uh, I leave the floor to you, uh, especially now to you, Mara. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, um, for the introduction. And uh, I think I can say on behalf of all three of us that we're delighted to be here tonight or this afternoon on the sunny day in London. Um, I would like to start off by just asking you, Mara, whether you could say a few words about Paula's work and the connecting narratives between Paula's and Cliff's work. That would be a wonderful start to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you. Hello, everybody. 
Um, right. Okay. So I can start by saying that. Um, so what what strikes me most about Paula Grego's works is um, precisely the way that she managed to vi visually create tough, provoking uh, works. And when I say this, is when uh, the way that she addresses problematics. And what interests interesting uh, interests me more, most is um, the way that these very same problematics that she addresses in her work are still very current today. And that was part of uh, the attraction to also invite her to participate in this exhibition. She is one of the most important um, artists from, from, from her generation. Um, but obviously that the way that she conveys her, her own uh, messages and the way that she conveys these this problematics within society um, are, are always subjects that um, interests me and in my curatorial works and projects. And, and um, about the, the, the narratives that, that connects Paul Rego and Cliff, I wouldn't go so much about the connecting or the connected narratives. I would go much more towards the fact that I, I wanted to show different realities within different generations. And, and obviously that because this project is integrated within the Portuguese presidency from the European Council, and uh, part of their program focuses on the challenges that we are facing. I wanted to find uh, an artist in which the work could resonate um, different problematics within society as well. Uh, so I think that that might answer your question. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, it does. Um, but maybe more specifically, I think you had more than 30 um, applications to an open call looking at different artists. What was it specifically that you found intriguing about Cliff's work in relation to Paula Rigo's work? Yeah. Uh, yes, that, that's very true. So, so the, the applications were open only to Portuguese artists living in the UK, uh, which, which we thought to be um, important to somehow support artists that are abroad and, and trying um, to find new opportunities within the art industry. Um, so, so obviously we, we, we were not expecting to have many applications, uh, but 30 were, 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 were a good number and, and very interesting submissions as well. What um, caught my attention um, in Cliff's work well, first of all, was his uh, versatility um, in terms of the presented body of works, because there's there's a different range of materials, as we will see as we go along in this conversation, um, and so he has such such a range of different materials that was very interesting to me and intriguing at the same time, and and also the fact that. He, his work, and, and I mean, specifically this body of works is trying to, uh, are trying to, to research about identity and belonging. And this is, uh, this is also a very current subject that we are facing, not only today, but I guess a humankind faces this, all these questions about identity and belonging um, all the time. Uh, so I was, really intrigued by that. And that was one of the reasons that not only the technical part, obviously, but also the, the thematic behind, the concept behind. Thanks so much. And maybe over to you, Cliff. Why did you respond to the open call? What resonated with you? And um, where did you personally feel that connection to possibly also Paula Rigo's work? Um, well, for me, it was, um, well, to start with how I heard, I actually heard about the open call um, through a, another fr a friend of mine who was also like me, the, the descendant of, of Portuguese parents, but who, who grew up here in the, in the UK and has spent most of his life here. Um, and so it came to me via an Anglo-Portuguese connection, which, which was apt. Um, but the reason... I decided to apply was was not so much the the Paula Rego angle because there are 
as we'll talk about later, there are clear links, clear references in my work to Paola Rego and, and, and her work was a big inspiration uh, behind some of the pieces. But there was nothing in the open call that specified that, that they were looking for work that was related to, li in, literally related to Paolo Rego directly. Um, so that wasn't really a factor in my application. It was more um, because I want, well, firstly, because it was an opportunity for Anglo Portuguese voices in the UK, which for whom specific opportunities like that don't, don't come along very often. But also, I think, because I felt that there is perhaps, um, in my experience, the voice of, of Portuguese people in the UK <clears throat> tends to be dominated by um, a certain subsection of, 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 of Portuguese society, i.e. those who have the means to leave Portugal and come and, and live in the UK. And it's not often that I see the voices of uh, people who have been forced to come to the UK of, of, in generations past, of, that I see those voices reflected back at me. So I thought was, I wanted to put my my hat in the ring, so to speak, to to represent that voice of um, one that sits outside perhaps the dominant narratives that you see um, reflected in in Portuguese uh, about Portuguese culture in in the UK, certainly in the UK art scene, and and most of the time more broadly, although of course not exclusively. That's very interesting. Would you like to describe the artwork you submitted um, to a bit little more for our audience, just so that we yeah, of course, so, a bit more, not being able to be in the exhibitions ourselves? <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. So I submitted four pieces, and I was very, um, I was delighted that that Mada chose to to show all four of them. Um, because it was stipulated in the open call that you wouldn't necessarily show all the pieces that you had put forward. Um, and I'll, I'll go through them in chronological order in which they were made. I think that, that makes the most sense because they do kind of follow on from uh, one another in my mind, although that might not be, might not be uh, obvious at first sight. But the, um, the first is a triptych of prints. And when I say prints, I mean traditional printmaking methods. There's two etchings and a, and a lithograph. Um, and those were the ones that are, or that were, I guess, most closely inspired by um, Paolo Rego in that um, they tell the story of my um, parents. My parents are the model, but it's not specifically about them. It's more the stories that I've gathered from my parents, uh, my uncles, uh, other other members of the Anglo-Portuguese community of that generation, of their experiences of, of coming to this country from the Portugal that they left. And we have to remember that the Portugal that they left is a very different Portugal from now, not solely due to the passage of time, which would seem fairly obvious, but also because they left when Portugal was still under the Salazar regime. So they left a, politically a very different place. And so they have a very particular experience of, of migration and disconnection up from home. And that's what those prints were trying to relate with these uh, broad themes of, of, um, of belonging and, and what it's like when that belonging is severed um, with thrown in little elements of, of more specifics to those, to those particular stories. And I say they're directly um, uh, they're heavily inspired by Palo Rego because these are, although these issues had always been in my mind and they'd always been floating around and I'd been trying to grapple with them, I never really thought that there was, uh, let's say, potential in them to make art, which I, looking back now seems like a really stupid and naive thing to say, but there was definitely a time when I, I didn't think that these things were, were important to be told. And it was seeing her work and how she related from how she used personal experience and put that into pictures that I thought, oh, I can do that. I have important, my stories are important and they're very different and they, and they should be heard. Um, and then I took those three prints and I created, if those three prints, if we think of those three prints as the story of, of my parents, 
the next three prints, which is another triptych, um, bring those stories into my story. And I th and what I was trying to do was find my place within my parents' narrative, I guess. And when I say prints this time, I mean digital prints. So the next three works I submitted were um, photo collage collages, and they were originally intended to be real collages, to use the printed matter and the prints and to, to layer them on top of each other in a, in a Wolfgang Tillmans-esque kind of fashion. But because of, um, because of the pandemic, you know, I was forced to work digitally. And so I created these digital photographic digital collages. And really what I was thinking about was, or what I wanted to show was that our history is only one um, influence among us. And actually um, our identities and our experiences are an amalgamation of of lots of different strands of experiences and, and and memories and and visual material and whatever it might be, and that they're always they're constantly competing. I don't I don't believe in this kind of idea of fixed identity. Um, and obviously, my parents' story is a part of that, and maybe a key part of that, and hence they're framed cent centrally and formally within the images. But they're also just one part of many different competing influences, and those influences are there's imagery there that Portuguese people would straight away recognize which yeah. might go over English people's heads and, and vice versa there's images in there that are very British and that a Portuguese person wouldn't wouldn't quite grasp the cultural weight of. Sorry um, uh, Cliff let me just ask you something because there, there's there's um, literally we can see a rec recollection here of of memories in a way mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so these memories of are, are part of, of what your uh, of your parents' memories at the same time because there's very specific um, imagery here. So how how did you um, select uh, these images in this in this way to, to make to create your own you know, final work of, of memories in a way? I think I, I yeah that's a good question and I'd be lying in, if I created a narrative now about how I selected them it would. It would be uh, it would be slightly manufactured because um, <laughs> the narrative for that isn't linear like in like in life things pop into your head and pop out and, and come back and go in different times. But I think um, one thing I tried to do was to almost like almost like meditate on on like on the images of. Yeah, on the on in, in I'm talking about in my mind on the image of my parents, or the feeling that I had when I was a child, and let the, the just naturally let images float to the top, and grab them as they came, and that's why there's things in there like like I spoke to you at the exhibition about uh, the the free shepherds of Fatima, those things, I mean that if you are straight off the top but when I was sat and quietly and thought about these things for some reason that image kept repeating and it was obviously something that would have been in the house but that maybe I, yeah. I consciously wasn't at the front of my mind and I think it was really it was that kind of process it, it took quite a long time and you know sometimes you're just walking down the street and something just because you've been working at something then suddenly something just pops into your mind and like you're like oh yeah that is that is one that is a key one and i'm so glad that that came back to me out of nowhere yeah that's interesting um, it's almost like and a I, I try i do try and work very organically like that in the same way you know in, in the process that's very much that i tried to capture very much in the film it's this kind of organic letting things flow and not being too uh, controlling and prejudging about what needs to be in the picture if that makes sense Yeah, it does make sense. It's really interesting to see this. It's, it's almost like a, um, a puzzle, a memory puzzle that you are trying to, to, to put together, um, which is quite interesting. But going a bit um, to the previous triptych, um, there's, there's different elements that you've used for your etchings, which is the sardine mm -hmm. and then the bottle of wine. Do you, 
-hmm. what 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 does these elements mean mean to you in the in, in this search that you are trying to um, to find within within your um, your own creative process? Um, I think when I was making this pic these pictures, it is, and you know, as I would say, it always is um, a process of um, trying to discover and constantly learning there's nothing definitive in these images um and i think in those etchings i i was i was playing i was playing with symbols um to see um what would happen how people would read the images how they would you know how they would feel um and that's that's always what i'm doing it is it's always a game of uh, experimenting and, and seeing what happens and, and going back and thinking again in those particular images um the cockerel is quite a literal reference to, to portugal um with the gold the bells, which is like one of the national symbols obviously as you know um but it also is a a reference to the fact that when i was young and we used to go to Mbeda, <clears throat> Um, which is where my parents are from. Um, one of my most, my strongest memories of, of being there, or strongest uh, motifs of being there, is that the cockerel would always wake you up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, if you compare, if you, and because it's such a strong contrast to, to the rest of our life, which is spent in inner city London, mm -hmm. where like a, maybe a police car would wake you up in the morning, driving by, not knocking at your door, I mean. Um, and the fish, a fish again, because there's bacalao is the national dish, so it's a Portuguese reference, but it's also a reference the fish is the symbol of the islander, and both my parents are obviously from Madeira, so they're islanders. Mm -hmm. But also there's the idiom, the ink, the British idiom, a fish out of water, i.e. the fish, a fish needs to be in water. And when if you're a fish out of water, you you stick out like a sore thumb. You're you're in the wrong place. You're not in your home environment. And that, I think that's how they felt throughout the whole of their lives. And, and that's, that's the, the purpose of the fish. Um, and the alcohol bottle, um, and this is obviously a motif that's reflected in my installation, is the fact that um, because of, I believe, and this is something I'm still exploring, so again, it's not definitive, um, but I have questions about, because of the particular experiences that my father and men of his generation had, there's a um, extremely high rate of alcoholism in that Portuguese generation of men, um, way above average. And that's something that was always in the background of, of my upbringing. And, and the bottle is always there in the images because it's always in the background. And, it, and you know, and, and just to finish off, these are, these are techniques, like I said, these images were inspired by um, Paolo Rego. And I think it's quite obvious that I was trying to experiment to use uh, symbols in the same way that she does when she always uses, and you know, she often uses, there'll be a cabbage lurking somewhere as a, Portu as a symbol of Portugal for her and other bits and bobs. And that, that's kind of what I was, I was playing with and, and what I was experimenting with. Thanks so much, Cliff. Um, now we Maybe just for our audience who are not from Portugal, you were just re referencing to the experience that that generation of men had, which experience mm. do you mean? What can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah. So, and this is so the middle of the free middle of the free prints of those original prints is um, is 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 a, is a male figure based on my dad, but as I say, not exclusively uh, my dad, um, sitting in our in 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 our kitchen. That in the kitchen that I grew up in, with um, asleep uh, with a gun and with a rifle in his hand, and it's called the Luzu Tropicalismo, and that's a very direct reference to um, the fact that uh, that generation of of men in Portugal were were con were um, conscripted into the army at the age of uh, seventeen and would have done one year of training in Lisbon. So if you were from Madeira, like my parents were, my dad would have gone to 
to mainland Portugal. I'd done a year of training um, and then been shipped to Africa to fight in the, in the Portuguese colonial war for three years without leave. And um, they either went to Angola, my dad went to Angola. Um, you know, I have other, other, I know other people who went to Mozambique um, and others to, to Guinea-Bissau. Um, and I think that left, that, that, that left an, in, in, an indelible mark on them <clears throat> and um, is, is uh, one of the key one of the key experiences in their life that my, the questions I have is, is whether they ever really recovered from that, especially that when it's then quickly followed up with, with having to migrate for financial reasons. And that's one of the areas in my work that I'm still yet to explore that, that I really want to delve a lot deeper into. And now I'm only, I'm only beginning to, to explore and, and have begun to explore. Thanks so much. Something that is very striking when you speak um, is that your work is so much about belonging and identity. Um, what does that word belonging mean to you personally, Cliff? And maybe also I, in the text that you wrote, um, I was quite taken away by your quote on your own European identity and how this, to a certain extent, has been taken away from you um, mm. through the political developments of the last years. So can you elaborate a little bit on this, what belonging means to you, but also maybe what does that European identity really mean and what it, how you would describe it? Mm. I don't, I and mean, the only answer is that, that, and I hope it doesn't sound like a non-answer, is that um, I, don't, I don't think I know what belonging means to me. And I think that's what my work is about, is about trying to, to to explore what that does mean i know what i'm told it means um but i don't think that what i'm told it means fits with my lived experience and therefore does that mean i i can never belong or does that mean that the definition is perhaps um slightly incorrect that, I think that's that's what a lot a lot of my I think that's probably the central motivator in my work. It, to go to the European question before I before I elaborate on that, the European thing. Do you, do you know what it was? It was, and uh, uh, I'm talking very much about when I was growing up. This, this isn't how I feel now, but I think, and I've spoken to a lot of my friends who are. Uh, you know, uh, split identity, let's use that word for ease, like I am. And they, they all speak of a similar phenomenon, which is that when we were young, because we weren't fully Portuguese or, or you know, Spanish, Italian, I grew up in a very multicultural area of London. So whatever nationality it might be, but in my case, obviously Portuguese, because we weren't fully Portuguese and we weren't fully English. There was always this feeling that you didn't quite, you maybe you weren't like, you didn't quite fit in either. And I think the main, one of the main reasons of, about why that was is because you never saw your, your own situation reflected back on you. You saw very English things in England and very Portuguese things in Portugal, but you never saw the middle ground. You know, it was never on TV. Um, you never saw, uh, you know, families in, in photos, uh, never looked like you, um, <clears throat> things like that. Um, and the European project kind of gave you solace because you were like, oh, that's the answer. I'm not fully Portuguese and I'm not fully English because I'm the future, because I'm European. And the other, th because that, that, that umbrella term covers both. And then you're like, oh, it's okay that I can't look back and draw a lineage in either country, a full lineage in either country, because I can look back because both those countries fall under a common European lineage and therefore my lineage is not seven. I mean, that's, that's a big thing about what it was. And so you were like, and then it was okay that people, they didn't see your story reflected back at you because you were like, because my story is new 
and uh, my and that's where the world is heading and so my story the time for my story will come and that's where we're, we're all moving towards and so there was a, there was a solace in that um and then yeah and then i don't know i i kind of didn't i i don't think that now i have much more complex understanding and investigations of identity um but when the brexit vote happened it did make me reflect and think if i had been a teenager or, or a child now at, at this time when brexit had been voted for how would that have made me feel and, and would i have, how would that have impacted me and i think talking to a lot of my friends we all had that kind of that kind of uh, it, it did create a kind of a schism inside you that you're like oh now we're back to not really knowing not really having an easy word about what we are even if even if we weren't using that word and we'd moved beyond it you still sort of had it in the back of your mind if that makes sense so yeah that was that's something i i definitely i definitely thought about a lot that's that's very interesting cliff and i i think that um it's also what why you um, in a way, I think that your work kind of resonates with 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 anyone, not only with with people who you know have have um, a different background or or their parents are are from European countries and they were born in in the UK, but I think that it resonates also with anyone that moves um, out of their own country, out of their comf comfort zone moves to a new country uh, in search for new opportunities. And I think that the, that, that question of identity and belonging um, at somewhat and some, somehow with time starts to be present. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so I, I, your work relates a lot to, to, to many people in that way. I mean, at least in my perspective. Um, and, and talking with with uh, with so many people from from different uh, countries that are living for 15 20 years in the UK they all at some point feel that that very very same uh, struggles or questions about that belonging and identity uh, I think that's really striking um, also yeah. in your work thank you and I think yeah thank you very much I mean that's and I think that these questions can only, I do really believe that these questions, not that they can be answered because I don't know if there's an answer, mm -hmm. but what I do think is that the more information we have, the better we can make, try and make better decisions, if that makes sense. And so many voices of those past immigrants are missing. And if we don't have those voices and, and know what, what those experiences were, then we can't hope to to use them to try and make better decisions in the future, especially at a time in a political climate in England where the stories about immigrants that I see on the TV or the media or whatever it might be don't reflect my experience of the migrant story. And that's not to say that they're wrong, but it's just to say that there's a lot of stories missing and that i think that that's that's a problem yes i agree i agree with you yeah i think that that there's a um, there's a sense of um you know telling the stories of migrants but um sometimes they are addressed um in a way that they they are just addressing the 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 good side or successful stories, there's a lot more to that, right? Um, so I, I do agree mm. with, with, with what you are saying as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also completely agree what you say. And also I, I somehow feel um, that the search for identity and belonging Cliff, is such a universal human search really. Um, and I think for many, it's also increasingly important to know where this belonging is really and how, how they would describe it because of the globalization and because of maybe also 
disappointments of prom political promises that people have um, heard about, um, or also their, their feeling of things being taken away from them, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really a very, you know, a very crucial topic of our time um, and a very human, uh, and a deeply human search um, that is so essential to all of us. Um, and I'm, I was wondering when I was reading your, about your work and looking at your artwork, how, where, how you as an artist also, or personally also, how you connect this kind of, um, this aspect of being local somewhere and being connected to something, and then this more abstract international European globalization or world, um, but that, that for you also has become a home because it just meant that different histories and stories came together essentially, as you just described it. How do you connect it personally? How, how, do, you, how do you lift this combination? Um, well, I think, uh, I guess I live it by, by making art. And one of the reasons I started to make art in the first place was because I had all these questions and um, doing another job, I, I didn't have time to explore them. So they just all, all sat there building up or gathering dust or whatever they were doing. Um, and so I, I, I use art to, to give me the space to explore, to explore those questions. And I, I do think, I do, I do want to emphasize that they, they are what they are questions and what I'm doing is, is not providing answers, but it's exploring them. I think there's a tendency with work for people to go, you know, to read it as a, this is what someone thinks. They've made this work, this is what they think. But I don't think of my work like that. I think of it more as this is what I'm thinking about. And this is where I've got to in, in my thinking, but it's an open question. And the identity and belonging one is so complicated that, that it can only be framed like that, I think. Um, I, and I think there's, I mean, you asked before about what belonging means to me. And I think that to, it's so complex because there's so many parts to that question. And the firstly, one of the key questions I'm always asking in my work is, do we need to belong? And there's a, there's a kind of assumption, it's almost like an unwritten, it's, it, you know, it, it's, also, it, it's almost so obvious that it's, you forget to ask the question, but do we actually have the need to belong or is this a construct? Now, the answer, on this answer is I don't know. I think that we do, <clears throat> so I'm going down that angle. But then the next question belongs then, what, what do we need to belong to? And what does that belonging look like? And how, how is it structured? And I think in, in a modern, certainly in, in a modern climate, and by modern, I mean, you know, the, since the creation of the nation state, so in the last 200 years, that belonging is almost a no brainer. That belonging is connected to some kind of idea of the nation or the nation state. But that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a construct. And so another key question is, does that belonging necessarily have to be connected to a nation state? Or are, are we missing something? Are we forgetting to ask the obvious question? And I think that's where the point about local versus international comes in. I think mean, we are moving to a time where uh, the dominance of the nation state as the, as the basic unit of identity, if you like, is, is being severely challenged. And if and so where what does if if we have if we have hooked identity to our nation so strongly, what happens when that starts to break down? Or what happens when the when the economic forces change the shape of the world? And I think that's um, that's a, that's one of the big questions I have to tackle in my work. And one of the big problems I I've had and that. As in, I was talking about my experiences as a child, and I think one of the big problems that people in that space have is that um, national identity or 
identity of a country is often strongly linked to unbroken history. So, you know, to be English is to, to love cottages, which are old, obviously, and to uh, be nostalgic. I mean, this is, this is a vast reduction, um, um, but just for the ease for this talk, you know, be in some way, um, have an emotional relationship with the empire, whether that be positive or negative. You know, think about Winston Churchill, think about Nelson. All these things are historical. And so how do you then, um, how do you consolidate that against people who come to this country and don't share that history because they, for a simple fact, that they, they haven't been here. And that becomes a massive tension. And so really, I think I'm moving to a place where we think of, we need to think of identity as experiential about the now and how you're interacting now, rather than looking back, uh, rather than thinking of it as, a, as an unbroken lineage. Because if you, if you think of it as an unbroken lineage and that's your only way for thinking of identity, then by its very definition, it's going to exclude hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who can't, who can't tie into that lineage through the fact that they simply don't have it. Um, and in a world where we're moving around so much, and I think that's a good thing, that that can't persist. Otherwise, like I said, a lot of people are going to be excluded. So that's one of the big questions for me is how do we rethink this? And how do so that we can all function in, in, in the world moving forward. So it sounds quite grandiose, but that I'm just uh, I'm just uh, trying to put it in, in terms that I can explain easily. Thanks so much. Um, maybe I do want to say to our audience, if you would uh, want to pose a question, please feel free. Um, to write them in the chat. Um, and we do have one comment here. So Rita wrote, Portuguese are very nostalgic also and not, and while not investing as much in tradition and heritage, we are more similar than not in my opinion. Britishness is a blend of many places as being Portuguese also. That's more of a comment. And we have one question from a uh, two cliff from, from Lorenzo. Um, who is asking your works and the way you investigate memories, especially the photo montages, come across as somewhat melancholic and some sense of reparation. Is that your intention? It's not my intention, so I'm Portuguese, so I can't help being nostalgic and melancholic. Right? That you need you need those qualities to get the passport. That's in the blood. Um, but no, I don't. No, I don't think so. I don't set out to to be melancholic. It's hard because I think it's one of those things that um, that um, that you kind of maybe don't really have control over, or that um, um, the viewer also might uh, slightly project into. Um, I think there is. Yeah, I get. Sorry, I can't. Please. Can I interrupt you? My perspective. Yeah, yeah, is, of is, is is that yeah, I, I I can understand the question because yeah, it is like I was saying before. It is like a recollection of memories. So um, mm. immediately it takes you to a nostalgic place, like remembering, you know, something, some iconography, some some icons, some images that will. Um, take you back some, somehow to, to, to a time where you were in a place with your parents in, at, in Madeira, for example, you know, so, so in that way, even without realizing, I think that you've, you've, you've kind of puzzled a recollection of nostalgia, or, or at least mm. that, that feeling, that sense is what we get, you know. Yeah, no, I totally, yeah. I mean, that, that's totally present. I think the key for me is that the past is obviously there, 
what you do with the past is the key. Mm-hmm. And um, if you make it work about the past, then it's obviously, there's always going to be read slightly nostalgically. I think that's normal and I think that's good. Um, the question is, the danger of nostalgia and the danger that I saw in my parents' generation is a question of what you do with the past. And what they did with the past was they let it dominate their present. That's option one. Option two is that you accept the past and you absorb it into your present, but you keep moving towards the future. And that's what I'm trying to do. So yes, I think it is nostalgic if we define nostalgia as looking back on the past and assessing it. But I, I would, I, I'm, in my own work, I'm very keen to avoid the trap of the bad side of nostalgia, which is that it can it consumes the present. And I think a lot of my work is driven by a need to understand the past, but to understand it so that I can accept it and move forward, not, not so that I can understand it and stay there, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it does make sense. And I think that that's, that's precisely what we, what, it can be seen in your work and in your own search that um, search uh, um, for identity, uh, to, but to belong and to continue and to de- develop from, from there as well, uh, which I think it's, it's, it's a really important key, especially for those who... Um, who are not, for example, in this case, we are discussing this, obviously, for example, for those who who are not English, but they moved here and they've built their life here, um, it is important to kind of break somehow with that nostalgia from the past to to be able to set set roots uh, in a country that is not yours and move forward in a way, you know. Mm. Yeah, exactly. But to not, but that doesn't, but yet not to forget the past, to use yes. it equally as some as another source of strength and yeah, and of It is your roots. Um, uh, it will always be your roots. So yeah, they may not, must not be forgotten. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there was also, maybe to both of you, there was one um, little quote, Cliff, again, in your work, in uh, your text, um, where you Right, mm. that Portugal is irreversibly, irreversibly, that's a difficult word for me, mm. globalized. Um, mm. What do you mean by this? Is it also because of the colonial past? And, and Mara, maybe also to you, maybe to both of you, what, what, can, what do you understand by that? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I mean, th- th- I put that in there because it's relevant, but I put, I use those, those specific terms because it was in the, uh, it, they were referenced in the open call. So it was a little hook to show Mara that I, I had read everything, <laughs> um, I'd studied it properly. But I think, um, I think what I meant from it, and, and obviously Mara was with her own take, was that um, it, there's several different levels, but I guess maybe the simplest one is that the, Madeira, the, the Portugal, and when I say Portugal for me, it has to be seen through the lens of, of the island of Madeira because that's that's I didn't go to mainland Portugal until I was until I was ten. So my very early memories are, are there. And what I remember from that and from my parents' stories is that Portugal is quite a closed place. You know, it was, there was a very strict Catholicism. Uh, the Salazar regime was very, was quite was very orthodox, very strict. Portugal took a sort of a uh, quite an insular um, approach to um, to global politics. It wasn't involved <clears throat> officially. It wasn't involved in the war in the in the world wars. It took quite an isolationist policy. And obviously, then after that fell, and and with the uh, after Portugal joined the EU, that that's been blown apart, and Portugal has, has now taken a very uh, internationalist uh, perspective and. And, and a lot of that international money has helped it develop. A lot of the money comes from the EU, and it's on a path very much to to be out to be outward looking and to, and to continue to be so. 
but with that comes the fact that you're opening your doors and as much as you will gain from doing that and from letting yourself out you're also going to have to, to accept that stuff's coming the other way so portugal's become uh, you know people migrate to portugal and different influences will start to enter the country and have been doing so for 30 years and will change things and um, portugal is on the global scene and, and as we've seen in england or in britain i should say that can that can be a great benefit but it can also cause a backlash and you know then we could say that brexit could be seen as if you want to frame it in those terms could be seen as as a backlash against that that global like that um, that international globalized perspective and so um that battle uh, so portugal also has to be in a position where it can learn from those lessons of what might be coming and make sure that it 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 can it can deal with them in the way it wants to and this ties back to what i was talking about before whereas um portugal or portuguese identity portugal is <clears throat> or certainly was a phenomenally homogenous country ethnically um uh quite bizarrely in a european context i guess because of where it's positioned um and i think it has to and, and a lot of it's ident the identity of being Portuguese, the things you see, the things I was taught in Portuguese school, because I went to Portuguese school here in England after school, after my after English school, um, you know, was this very unbroken chain of Portuguese historicalness, which was the discoveries, and, uh, the reconquest. Um, but again, if you're tying your identity so closely to your history and you, but you're, you're opening yourself up to a planet where people can come in who don't share that history how are you going to how are you going to reconcile those two and that's the challenge for, for, for places like portugal moving forward is how do you reconcile that yeah. identity against a global world where people are moving as you said before people are moving about and maybe those things aren't going to be as relevant to that new world that you're entering yeah, I guess that I guess that um, that's that's a very good uh, point as well. I guess that when I mentioned uh, irreversibly globalized, I was I was um, touching points around how much uh, Portugal has become an attractive uh, country, and and all the circulation uh, from from people moving abroad, but the other way around. So how much we we have developed and grown, and and I was kind of also linking into the connection of, um, yeah, this globalization makes us connect more, especially with the, the growth of new technologies and the digital era, era uh, makes us connect more. So, so I guess that um, in a way building up from what you were saying, Cliff, um, it is, it, we, we can use uh, uh, definitely culture and, and other areas obviously, to, to kind of uh, fill that gaps and and build the, the, those connections and 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 show um, exchange uh, ideas and cultural um, ideas and cultural goals as well um, and so that was where I was uh, going when I was talking about globalization as well. Thanks so much. To you both. We are unfortunately already coming to the end of this conversation. Oh, we do have, wow. Yes, time really flies. Already? <laughs> yes. We do have um, one question here from Philippe, which to a certain extent I think has been answered, but I still want to pose it to you, Cliff. Um, how yep. will you keep processing the ideas of belonging and identity in your future art? So looking more at what you're currently producing or uh, maybe thinking about doing in the future. How will you keep exploring this in your work? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a few, um, there's so many questions still hanging in my work. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier about uh, delving in more to my father's experience of, of, of going to Africa and then, and then having and then migrating. Um, 
So there's loads of different areas that, you know, they, they, they could each be a lifetime's work and I want to try and tackle all of them. <clears throat> um, so I'll keep, I'll, I will keep looking into the history and trying to understand the, the circumstances that made my parents the way they did, because I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions there. But I think also that, um, I think one thing, what I'm doing is I'm trying to accumulate information, understanding to then see if I, to then see if I can transcend it in a way, or it maybe transcends the wrong word, but sort of move through it. Like I was saying before, to accept the past and not be stuck, not be, not be stuck in it, but to accept it and move on. And, um, the walking piece at the end, the, the fourth piece, which I didn't discuss, is, is a video. Yeah, that's, uh, I, was, I was about to, uh, to ask you about that one. And because um, uh, it's a moving image, which, which I will start mm. playing while you are talking now. But I also wanted you to somehow connect it because I, I think there's a, a, an extension or a development from your ongoing project. So you are at this at this very mo moment um, with, with an ongoing project for a grand cause. And I would like you to also talk about that. And I'll leave the links in the chat uh, um, later on. Yeah, sure. So the, the video piece, I, I walk a lot and I always have done. And I used to use it as a way to like, uh, to process, like if I was struggling in the studio, I'd walk. And I always sort of considered it was a kind of a tool, but not, not an end in itself. And it was when I was doing my MA that I started to actually um, really look into the walking itself as a way of, uh, as, a, as, a, as maybe an art form or certainly as a way of exploring the issues that I was thinking about. Because I really enjoyed and found that I could think deeper um, when I walked, the way the ideas would flow and the memories that would come back to me and how I would process them would be different from when I was sitting in the studio. And that's, that's kind of what the video is about. It's, it's trying to capture that. And I had to do it in Google Maps because it was the pandemic and I wasn't allowed out of my house as, as we all were. Um, but what happened was as I walked further and further, I actually found that my mind quietened down um, and eventually became silent and I became very focused in the moment um, and the way I was feeling physically, the pain in my feet and my back and whatever it is. Um, and I became really interested in this idea that perhaps walking can be used to transcend thought. So, i.e., by extension, maybe it can be used to tra transcend the idea of, of of being consumed by history and trying to belong. Maybe there's actually something on the other side and walking is the tool to get us there. And that's why I'm interested in exploring and I'm drawing in ideas, you know, this links very closely to ideas of uh, Buddhist ideas or more specifically Zen Buddhist ideas of meditation through repetition to reach like a, to reach beyond thought. I'm trying to explore all these things and, um, but that's in very early stages. And what I'm doing now, what, what Mida was referencing is that um, I was very fortunate to get um, funding from the Arts Council to, to explore this further. So I'm currently on a walk across Britain um, from the, right at the top of John the Groats to, to all the way to the Borough and Land's End to give me the chance to explore extended walking and see, see what that feels like and what my experience of it is. And along the way, I've invited other artists who use walking to come and walk with me so that we can exchange ideas and to help me contextualize my own ideas within existing practice. And obviously, because it's a walk across Britain, and I'm very careful here, I'm not, because it's a walk across Britain, there is also, as there is always in my work, this idea of getting to know a country that I have been part of and is that part of my identity, but actually I only know a really small section. That's another facet of it. 
but it's to understand it's i think when you talk in those terms you have to be very careful and not, it's not a it's not a stanley trekking across africa to dominate and conquer those times have gone thank god it's mm-hmm. instead it's a time it's a it's a walk to to observe and to try and understand myself a little bit better in the process but you are also so, yeah. raising raising funds for some institutions right I yeah just left the link in the chat so anyone thanks very is, much is, that's that's very kind of you yes because so as i was developing the pro- the project didn't start off as an end-to-end walk it started as a long walk and i was inviting people and then i was also wanted to visit artists on the way and uh, as more and more joined the project uh, the first one was in edinburgh like as when i drew the map i realized that the, the first guy that i could see would be in edinburgh and the last one would be in devon so i thought well if i'm going that far i might as well just do the whole thing and uh, do it as a as a charity challenge to to raise money for um, for free diff- for free charities inspired by my mum who's no longer with us um so yeah i'm walking for charity and along the way i'll be doing bits of the work with these artists um, that's really fantastic and, that's, and i can't that's... wait to see um to see what you 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 are working on when you when you are then <laughs> in two months time because it will take you two months so um, can't wait to yeah. see your work um back there yeah that's great thank you Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, sounds um, like yeah. a beautiful project ahead it of is, you. It is a beautiful project, yes. Um, so I guess that we, we, need to, we need to go, right? But I wanted to ask you something, Katrin, by the way. Um, I would like to also ask you, and this will be like the last, the last question before we go. Um, so you, you work as a regional head of program for the arts at the Goethe Institute in London. And I wanted to, um, to ask you, what are the most current challenges in the midst of a pandemic? And what are the plans in place at the moment to continue um, your in- interdisciplinary work, or the Institute's interdisciplinary work? Yeah, oh, that's a big question, Mara. Um, I think, the the most crucial question for us in the beginning of the pandemic was really how we can continue to be there for the artists and to essentially stand for what what we stand for so to support artists to kind of still engage with this transcultural relations etc um despite the pandemic and that that was really very much at the center of what everything of what we have been doing um And I think a second challenge um, has been, and I also really want to see it as as something really positive, as we could also see in Cliff's work, um, is exploring the possibilities of the digital um, in all ways. And I'm, you know, really also the question, what does, for example, the aesthetic experience mean in in the digital space when when the senses are so reduced? Um, And so, um, yeah, just really trying to use this time also in, exploring all these possibilities because obviously as we all know they will be the part of our future so yeah, i think we've true. all been in this acceleration really um now I, the third one i would say um is really much about you know this whole aspect of health and care um the, the effects that the pandemic has had on so many people societies communities etc and i'm sure there will be many backlashes of this pandemic. So that's that's another huge topic for us um, as for many cultural institutions around us. Um, yeah. So yeah, and obviously the, the economics, um, both for the artists, the art, the cultural sector, um, but also for us as an institution. Um, so yeah, the many challenges, but I, I must really also say that, that we've really, uh, somehow found a focus uh, in some ways also in the pandemic because of this reduction that, that we had. So I, I, I've also seen some very innovative ideas, um, very sustainable approaches for the future. So there is also 
that hope that maybe I would like to end the talk on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, that is really part of this these last months. Yeah. Yes, that's very true. I think that the world stopped in a way, but um, what I felt was what I've been seeing as well is there's a, there's a, there's hunger and the will um, to 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 reshape, restructure, and move on. The show must go on and. And we are here, and we need to 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 you know to uh, get um, uh, maybe gain back the time that we've lost in a way, and take it and rebuild it into something that can be um, um, useful and important and helpful. Yeah, and you a better know? version of. of yes, what? yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, but Thank really, you. really good to speak mm. to you both. Um, Thank you, Cliff. Really good to meet you. And thank you to Mara. Thank you. And now I briefly hand back to Maria. Uh, thank you all. It was a pleasure to, to have this conversation today. Uh, and well, I guess we are, we are done for today. And we'll be back to, uh, next week, next Tuesday. So next Tuesday we'll uh, we'll be having the last um, uh, talk, so the last event of our parallel program, uh, and the conversation will be around Paula Rego's work, uh, and so follow our social networking to to see the details and to book. Don't forget to book the event bright um, mm -hmm. to get the the, <laughs> the Zoom link. Otherwise, we, we share the live just like we are doing today on our Facebook pages. Um, Cliff, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank and you. well, good luck on your, on your, I don't know how to call it now, your, your walk, let's say, <laughs> your walk, yeah, <laughs> your, thank big, you. thank your big walk. We'll meet here again when you finish with the result Hope of your so. work. Uh, yeah, and get you updated. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We'll, we will uh, be following you. And we'll be following you. Exactly. We'll be following you. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. See you next Thanks week. For the okay. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Take care. You too. Bye bye.